All the way from Bokota Village in Limpopo, South Africa, we bring you Missionary Minds, where you can learn about family, church history, biblical worldview issues, and of course, missions. All from the mind of a real world missionary of almost 20 years. And once again, we have Buddy Seth in the studio. And today, our question we want to address is, the government says not to spank my child. And frankly, I don't enjoy it either. What should I do? So, Buddy Seth, as someone with a number of children of your own and experience in this area, could you speak to us, uh, firstly, possibly about what the scriptures say about children? Are you saying that I have experience in civil disobedience? Or that I have <laughs> experience with children? Or ex- in Quashua. <laughs> Every man needs to be convinced of what the scripture teaches. And they need to be convinced that they are following the word of God. So, go back to the Bible, and then if... If you have read through the scriptures and read through the Word of God, and you have come to a firm conclusion that the Bible teaches a certain thing, then you need to do that thing, regardless of the culture and regardless of the government. Every every authority has its sphere, and there are three spheres. That would be the the home and the government and the church, and they ought not um, infringe upon the other, although they all overlap so that parents and children will overlap to a degree with the church and to a degree with the state, and the state will overlap to a degree with the church and the family. But we need to start with first principles and ask ourselves, what does the scriptures teach on any matter? Maybe we can start there with what are some of the principles that the scripture teaches? Uh, So why the need to spank in the first place? I think if you believe in total depravity, then you have to believe that sin is a big problem in my child, just like it's a big problem in me. And if you read the book of Leviticus, uh, I'm sure everyone thinks of Leviticus as a manual on spanking. No, that's a joke, obviously, because it doesn't say anything about it, except that it says, if you're going to deal with sin, there's seven straight chapters that dealing with sin requires these um, horrific demonstrations. And what we learn from that is how bad sin is. It's all the way through the Old Testament. Sin is terrible. And if you see the lengths to which God goes to cure or to deal or to treat the problem of sin, that might give us a hint that when we think of our children, we should be thinking sin is a great problem. Sin is a a deep and enduring problem. It is very difficult. And so, I would say start with some presuppositions. First of all, total depravity. You say total depravity. Maybe our whole audience doesn't understand what you mean there. So could you break that down? Thanks. The classic definition of total depravity is simply sin has touched every part of my being. So it's touched my mind. It's touched my will. It's touched my body. It touches the spiritual part of me. It touches the physical part of me. It touches the physical part of me, which is why I die. There was no death before sin, and there will be no death after sin. But because I have sin, I get gray hair, I get tired, my bones break, I'm getting older, I can't do what I used to do, etc., etc. Sin touches our body. Everyone agrees with that. That's where diseases come from. And then sin touches our mind. That's why we forget. We forget things we shouldn't forget. Like I was just reading Psalm 103 this morning, and it said, Forget not all his benefits. Well, why would David have to talk to his soul and say, oh, my soul, do not forget his benefits, except that his soul was prone to forget his benefits. And we know that because 2 Samuel, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel 30 verse 6 says, and David was distressed because the people thought to stone him. So he's overwhelmed, he's discouraged, he's in a kind of beginning depression. But then the next phrase, as many people already know, but David encouraged himself in the Lord so that his depression was warded off by remembering. Well, total depravity just means in our our memories, we're going to be tempted to forget. Or David again, in 2 Samuel, when he sins with Bathsheba, Nathan comes to him and says, here's a story. There's a man with with this um, whole flock of sheep, and a rich man comes to him, 
And he doesn't take one from his own flock. He goes to the poor man who only has one little ewe lamb. He takes that ewe lamb from the poor man, slaughters the ewe lamb, and gives it to his rich friend. And David says, of course, I'm very angry at this. This should never happen. That man will be punished. But why didn't David say what we're all thinking? Why didn't David say, oh my, it's me? No, Nathan has to say, no, David, what are you doing? It's you. It's you. You are the man. David's brain, his memory, was affected by total depravity. He forgot. He got confused. Same thing with uh, Peter. When Peter denies the Lord, later on it says he remembered the word of the Lord. He had forgotten. How can you forget the word of the Lord? It was only a few hours earlier that he told you, you're going to deny me. And Peter said, no, I won't. No, I won't. Everyone will deny you, but not me. And that's simply a reminder that sin affects our memories. And I could even say by that, Mark in your Bibles, every time you find a command or an encouragement to remember the word of the Lord, if you'll mark those down, you'll find they are constant. Uh, Forgetting is a, a great spiritual danger in the New Testament and the Old, and remembering is a great spiritual uh, discipline, a mandate. But that wouldn't need to be if, if our minds weren't totally depraved. So they are totally depraved. And we, we, are, we go straight from the womb speaking lies. Again, that's from David. Our minds are, our hearts are corrupt and exceedingly wicked. Jeremiah 17, 9. Uh, the best of our good works are, are filthy rags in his sight. We are dead. We are criminals. We are condemned to die. These are all different passages from the New Testament now. Uh, We are spiritual beggars. We are dust. Um, We are worms. But what does this mean? It just simply means our our sin has affected our mind. Our sin has affected our memories. Our sin has affected the way we compute. It's affected our wills. How else can you explain that God put into every woman a love for her baby? But we'll have women murdering their babies. Some time ago, one of my friends in Zimbabwe said, they heard a shout while they were working at home. It was from the school. He ran to the school and found out that a, a teenager, a teenage girl, had given birth at the school and thrown the baby into a pit toilet. And so this man found an access hole, jumped into the pit toilet, and recovered a, a, a now filthy baby. How can you explain that except that sin has touched that? How can you explain the examples of Scripture? with Herod murdering babies, etc. So maybe I'm now getting off the, taking too long on that, but. But it's actually, it's actually a good detour because it explains the comprehensive, comprehensiveness of how much uh, sin has affected us. And you spoke of that as the first presupposition that we start with when dealing with uh, what scripture says about the state of children. Um, Can you move on from that? Yeah, the problem is deep. And I mentioned this out of order, pardon me. But I mentioned Leviticus. The solution is, is drastic. So, uh, the problem is deep. The solution is drastic. And in Leviticus, it was blood. Now, of course, no one is saying that, that you don't copy every point. You, you copy the points that ought to be copied when you read the rest of the scripture. So, the, solu- the problem is very deep. And the, the solution is the solution to sin is drastic, but we must not jump ahead of ourselves and say uh, f- foolish and evil things. We just let the scriptures be our guide, and that's the whole point. Let the scriptures be our guide. When I look at my dear children, whom I love, and last night, all five of my children sat around the table, and we played games for an hour, and they loved it. And what did they say this morning? Dad, can we do it again? Because we hope that, that that's the attitude that should be in every home. The kids love the parents, and the parents love the kids, and Ah, we just don't have time for TV because we we don't want to take five minutes away that we could be spending with our children. Why would I? Why would I do something do something else when I could be spending time with my kids? I'm not even there attacking TV. I am saying we love our kids. So whatever I say, I'm not attacking the wonderful bond of happy joy in a family. We want to promote that. So start with the problem's really serious, and the solution is heavier than we think. If you start with that, then it won't be too difficult. Um, and then I say, uh, number three, history. Look back at history. Um, men have always, uh, men and women have always used the rod. 
all through history and all cultures. There's a word in Songa for chambutela, to spank or to discipline with a rod. How'd they get that? They didn't get it from Solomon. They had that long before they had the Bible because it's common in all cultures to recognize children need to be treated with corporal punishment. But then we do have the scriptures to tell us very clearly, and specifically Proverbs 22, Proverbs 29, Proverbs 13. You can remember those three, Proverbs 13, Proverbs 22, Proverbs 29, have a number of verses on um, disciplining the children with the rod. And if you don't discipline the children with the rod, you hate them. So that's the wisdom of Solomon. And when David didn't use that wisdom on his sons in 1 Kings 1, I think I referenced this before, 1 Kings 1, I didn't use that on Adonijah, and his, his children went on to death. They, they killed themselves, ultimately committed such crimes that they were worthy of death because they weren't disciplined, and the Bible explicitly says that. Same thing with Eli. He did not restrain his sons. And Solomon comes along and says, look at these guys in history. Do the right thing. Thanks, brother. That's helpful. Uh, if we look at what you said before, that there are three spheres, the home, the church, the government, and there's overlap between those spheres. So we're saying that scripture instructs the disciplining of children and the government uh, is responsible to make sure that uh, children are not abused. So now the issue of definitions comes in. The government's definition of abuse versus what a family sees as appropriate use of the rod for their child. Because even varying across cultures, uh, there will be different approaches to how much is too much and the like. So what are some guidelines we can use or that you use to develop maybe when to start and how much uh, force to use, what instrument, instruments to use and the like? Wow. Let me pause first of all and say in the New Testament, there are New Testament references for people who say, well, let's get out of the Old Testament. Hebrews 12, verses 5 to 8, references that the Lord uh, chastens or spanks, disciplines every son, and that it is painful. No discipline is painless. It is all painful for the moment, but it works in us something very good. So it is in the New Testament as well. Um, Not the we should necessarily need it from the New Testament, but it is in the New Testament, if people would question that. Um, When it comes to practical things, I think parents who love God and love their children are not going to struggle too much with those things. They may, in the moment, wonder, because they love their child, how can I answer some of these difficult practical things? But that's going to differ from child to child. Charlotte Mason, the, the educator, in the British educator, the late 1800s and early 1900s, Charlotte Mason's first educational principle was, children are born persons. And that is a little bit awkward um, linguistically, but it, what it means is, it means a number of things. One of the things it means is, children ought to be treated individually. So you might have a child that is different from another. Well, you will have, each child will be a little bit different, so the father needs to make those judgments. But we do that all the time, don't we? When we pick up a child, when we play with a child, my first son Caleb loved it when I tossed him in the air. Um, other children didn't like that. So, okay, this one doesn't like that thing. This one does like that. This one likes to, this one likes to, um, likes it when I tell stories. This one likes it when I give it a piggyback, uh, give him a piggyback ride. So, uh, parents will learn those things. And maybe you'll, you'll wonder and you'll talk with your wife about it. But, In general, if you love your child, and you love God, and you're praying to raise them, I don't think it's possible to go wrong. Parents parents do love their children, much more than the state ever could. The state doesn't love the child like the parent can. So if we just love our children, and then try to apply the scriptures, I'm, I'm sure it will work out in that region. There's an area that's too far, and there's an area that's too light. I was just reading Jordan Peterson this morning, 12 Rules for Life, and he mentions in there, there is a modern tendency ever since the 1960s to be too tender with our children, to try to shield them from every difficulty. And then he anticipates that someone will say, well, at least that's better than the other extreme. And it was, I was shocked, really, when I read that he said, 
don't think that it's necessarily good to go to one extreme, the extreme of tenderness over the extreme of abuse. He said the the extremes on either end of a moral continuum are horrible. And that's what that was what he said, but I thought, I've seen that myself. Look at David. In David's life, which we just cited, here's a man who said, oh, oh, I couldn't dare hurt my child, Adonijah. Well, Adonijah was killed by his brother. How about that? And uh, Amnon. Amnon was killed by his brother after raping his sister. David, don't you think you could have been a little bit harder? How do you think about that? You have multiple instances of fratricide, brothers murdering brothers in your family. Don't you think maybe those consequences were pretty harsh? Yeah. And even as you mentioned that, I think about my own upbringing. And if anything, my father was a very stern man with quite a heavy hand. And if uh, he tended towards the more extreme end on the other side. Uh, And how I describe it now is that, uh, sure, I would have preferred if things were more towards the biblical middle, but in the Lord's providence, I was brought up the way I was, and that means that all those bases before that were covered. Uh, And that's the, the, the... good I try and bring out of that negative situation. Um, But as you're speaking about this, I'd like to know, what are some methods that you've employed? Some people use a hand versus another instrument and the number of spanks. A guiding principle that we use in our house is we want much more laughter than crying. So for years, as a dad, I've watched that. I've told that to my wife and my children many, many times. But as a dad, I count that as I'm in control of the tap. I'm the one who gets to turn on how much laughter. Uh, of course, the kids will laugh and, and mom will laugh. But I need to be watching it all the time and seeing, okay, is there a lot of joy and happiness between my wife and the children, between me and the children, from the child to each child? I want my kids to get to be 30 and say, oh, our home, we, we were always laughing. Or I'd like them to go on evangelism and be in a home where there's shouting or, or um, anger and just feel pity for those people because they, they had n- no experience like that. We, we made it our goal, my wife and I, that there would be much more laughter. And so as a dad, I'm constantly watching saying, I'm in control of this. My wife does a lot of very important roles, but on this role, I need to make sure all the time, watching, has there been a lot of stress? Has there been a lot of fighting? Has it been just catty? Have there been a lot of situations of discipline? What can I do to make sure that we are laughing and happy? Uh, another illustration from the 12 Rules for Life book. The, uh, a, a client came to Jordan Peterson and said, Please help me with my son. He's every night to put him to bed. It's a 30 to 45 minute struggle where he's unhappy with me and I'm unhappy with him. And it's exhausting and I can't take it. What can I do? And Peterson said, we added up the time. If it's 30 minutes a day for, or 45 minutes a day for seven days a week, and then he multiplies it over the, over the weeks and months of a year. And then says, in a year, that's going to be however many, two weeks or three weeks or four weeks, basically, of 40-hour work weeks of you fighting with this person. And, and he said, you cannot possibly hope to have a good relationship with someone where two weeks or three weeks or four weeks or whatever the time was out of the year, you're fighting with them constantly. And that, that was a good insight that we don't want that. We want... Whatever unhappiness there is, we're going to deal with it, settle it decisively, and hopefully quickly, and in a sense, efficiently, although people are very inefficient, and relationships are rarely efficient. But as much as we can, we're going to settle it, and then it's going to be hugs and kisses and laughter and games again. So, that's, I think that's my first, that, that's our first and overriding principle. And then, so practically from that, I never disciplined my children where there was crying for even more than 30 seconds, usually 10 to 15 seconds. Um, I think once, if my son were here, 
he would say, once um, I disciplined him and it was over 30 seconds, but never over a minute. I can't remember it ever even being to 30 seconds. It's rare. So our goal was this should be a temporary, a temporary physical chastisement that should wear off quickly. And then very soon there's hugs and kisses and the relationship is restored. And you tell the child it's all settled. It's covered. Next time, what will you do? And they can handle it. Um, scripts. Let me just give a couple comments on scripts. Um, Shepherding a Child's Heart, which is an excellent book um, by Brother Tripp. And that book has a script, a sample script on what you can say. I, I tried to follow that, and then I wrote my own script when my kids were young, and I found that I didn't follow them very well because you have to remember them. But if you do it many times, maybe you'll remember it. But in general, my script with my children is, I sit down in the chair, and I have the children sitting in front of me, and I say, um, what did you do wrong? And then I want an admission. I want them to tell me what they did wrong. And I'm a rational creature, so if they, if they say, Dad, I didn't do anything, or I said this thing, but really it was another person who did these other things. Okay, fair enough. So you have a complaint. You say that you did this thing, and someone else did it. Let's deal with yours first and then theirs. Then just calmly and logically. Okay, what? So you say, but first of all, when you, when you took away his toy, do you think that was a good thing or a bad thing? Okay, it was bad. Okay, was it a serious bad, a small bad, or medium? What, what, what was it? And then they'll tell me. And generally, I can tell pretty quickly, okay, this is... But we're starting to measure and put proportion on the offense. And sometimes you have to invite another child into the discussion, because maybe they also did something wrong. Or you need to invite your wife in and say, hey, it, it, this child's not explaining everything. What else happened? And then she can tell you, oh, no, I'll just tell you, there's been a string of problems throughout the day while you were gone. Or whatever it is, but you you identify and you define it. I found that our world does not like definitions. We're not good at definitions, maybe because we don't study logic. But when you ask clearly, what did you do wrong? You are doing the work of a dictionary. You're defining what is this particular matter, this specific incident. I want you to define the limits the beginning, middle, and end of your guilt in this matter. And be, be logical and cool and be, be willing to learn from the child if the child's going to tell you, but I didn't do that. I did this. Okay, fair enough. Was there anyone else involved in this? Let's talk to them as well. Then when you've established what it is, okay, is everyone agreed? Is, is this the thing you did? Was it right or wrong? Okay. And then if it is a, if it is a, a serious offense, then um, we would give two swats on the bottom. I would make the child stand up. They're not allowed to run. They're not allowed to scream. Uh, I'd give two swats, controlled and measured, and then pick the child up, hug them. Just quickly, uh, you said two swats. So the instrument you're using, hand versus... I have a wooden board that I cut years ago and just made a little wooden plank, maybe 16 inches long, or that'd be 300 um, millimeters. Um, a little wooden plank that I actually just had to get rid of or put away because we don't have to spank our children anymore. They're they're obedient. They, if now they need discipline, it's more serious. Just a, a word of rebuke to them will bring them to tears uh, because they really love us and they want to do what's right. Uh, I thank thank the Lord for that. Our youngest is about to turn eight, and we thank the Lord that He's answered our prayers. And it seems that all all of our children have given us their hearts, and we hope that they have our hearts as well. Yeah, and just just so you know, once again, if you put that uh, that wooden rod up for auction, I'll be one of the first in line there. But yeah, what, you said you had scriptures on there? Uh, I did not, but growing up, my father wrote three scriptures, one for each of his children. I have a brother and a sister. So myself, my brother, and my sister, we all had a verse from the Bible written on, on the paddle, and my father cut a board, uh, and then he would discipline us with that board. And uh, I, don't, I don't look back with regret or anger on my father. Um, growing up, I might have thought he was harsh. Now I look back and say, thank God for my father. Uh, and I would say this, I think my kids would all say the same thing. You're welcome to talk to them privately. Because I'm, I'm confident that uh, our kids love the home they grew up in. They are grateful that it had boundaries. 
and I don't I don't think they're bitter or bothered or hurt or or offended. All whatever pain comes is temporary. And that's exactly what Hebrews 12 says. It is for a little time in order to bring a greater good. And the children can recognize that even when they're small children, they can recognize this. You made a comment of when should you begin? We began when we could tell they had a will. And then, of course, the force is measured. So you measure the force to your dear child. And if you don't love your child or if you're angry, then you need to fix those problems before you do anything. Because Scripture says explicitly, Ephesians 6 verse 4, do not provoke them to anger. I don't think our children get angry when we discipline them. Um, because we don't, we do it with love, and we love these children. And they have a number of times seen tears in my eyes, because we, we care very deeply for them. And we are fearful lest they should go on in their sin and be Adonijah, or Amnon, or Absalom. What a treat, Mfundisi. I look forward to having follow-up questions and conversations on this very same issue, particularly on the point where you mentioned on when to stop. How do you identify when your child has, in your words, given you their heart and they're now obedient? To our audience, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to rate it and subscribe to keep posted with more upcoming content. Feel free to share this episode with someone who might find it interesting and submit any questions you may want answered in a future podcast. You can email those questions to paulschleyline at gmail.com. You can also visit betweentwocultures.com for other resources like this. I'm your host, Yamikani Katunga, and until next time, that's it from Missionary Minds.